and DC, we're just hoping that you listen. Welcome to District Divided, a DC sports podcast covering the DMV, specifically the sports department. As I just mentioned, I am Amit. Joining me, LC, KDOT, and Matt, it is good to see you all. And we've got a very, very fun episode because last Thursday night was an emotional roller coaster. The Washington football team escaped against the New York Giants 30-29. to We're going to recap that game. Basketball season is right around the corner for the NBA. So we're going to go around and talk about which player on the Wizards we are most excited to see this coming season and this preseason. And then the no-hate debate, which celebrity do you want to see give out a first pitch or coin toss to begin a game? And then, of course, it's the State of the Union, your DC Sports Wraparound coverage segment. Now, before I get into my tremendous Taylor Heineke bias over here. We're talking about the Washington football team and the New York Giants. LC, let's begin with you. You saw the game. What were your thoughts on it? And what were your thoughts on just the emotional roller coaster that it was? Absolutely a roller coaster. Um, I mean, I think even if you were not a fan of either of these teams, you would have enjoyed that game. You know, it's one of those that you want to watch anyway. Um, I mean, to the final moment, like, you we really redid the kick that would have failed to win the game. Absolutely insane game. Um, I, I thought on offense, you know, it, it was okay. It was good. A few things to to tighten up. But thinking about how we've talked about the def- the defense being the you know the the, the top part of this team, um, I think that was a little bit worrying. We talked a little bit last week about how if I think you said I mean, if they score twenty seven on us, you'll be worried. So. I think that met your threshold. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to assume that you're worried. So, I mean, it's like, it's one of those where you like, you feel euphoric because you won the game. You're like, you know, I, I can imagine them being in the locker room, like, hell yeah, we won that. But then as that was Thursday, like as Saturday hits and you think back in the game and like, shit, are we in trouble? Like we need to, we need to do way better than that. Um, so I think it was like, Super happy we won. That's great. But if you look at it with a little bit more analytical eye, objective eye, there's, there's a lot to work on. Oh, absolutely. And thank you for that recap. Because, yeah, 27 points. I thought you'd think the defense is good, but it struggled. It struggled again. KDOT, I want your thoughts on the game and also your thoughts specifically on how the defense did. Go ahead. So, I mean... <laughs> Here's the thing. If you, if you ask me that night or the days following, I'm still riding a high, right? But... We held, we, we almost lost to a New York Giants team in which nobody's really expecting to be competitive this year. So there is a little bit of, all right, let's, let's pause for a sec. Good things you could see on certain sides of the ball, but defensively, there are some things that we definitely need to shore up. And it's the same thing I've been saying, which is more than anything at the linebacker position. You can see what's happening as far as in the secondary with some of the, some of the young guys. Ben Emerson just had a few really good plays. He's had a few plays, just like any rookie cornerback does. You, it takes time. You know those guys are going to be out on an island every once in a while, and they're going to get beat. It's always the thing that happens regardless of how good some of these rookie cornerbacks are, unless you are just out the gate a Hall of Fame. You're going to have your struggles. But defensively, there are still certain things that the linebacker position will concern me. Jamin Davis, I will actually give credit to, has had, had an amazing game compared to what it is that we saw the first game. I was looking at PFF's uh, rankings, and he's coming in pretty solid across the board, especially in the coverage. He's ranked 11th amongst linebackers going into last night's game as far as in pass coverage. So you can see the speed and everything that he has is really, is, is really doing good things. But as much as he's doing great things when it comes to the pass defense, John Bostic is still a liability when it comes to coverage. And you can see a lot of those times he bites so hard on some of the play action that he's just never in the right position to make the play. And you see a, a tight end streaming across or wide receiver streaming across right in that second level, catching the ball right behind him. It's just it, it, that to me is going to be something that we have to sure up if we're going to be successful as successful as we need to be. Because if there's one unit that we did really concern ourselves with going into the season was the front four. And right now we can see that they're not getting the level of pressure that we expected them to do. Um, and, and you can see every time they dial up a blitz, pretty successful. All they need, all the front four needs is another guy or two and they're usually getting home. But If we need the front four to just get pressure so the linebackers can sit back there, it hasn't happened. And there needs to be a sense of urgency there for that defense to get that in check. And I was this close to calling Chase Young 99 for the rest of the season. Montez Sweat 90 for the rest of the season. Jonathan Allen would have kept his name. Uh, But these guys seemed like no names if we had lost that game. 
but it is a results driven league. And thank the Lord we won that game. K do you want to say something else here? Yeah. I mean, that's just on the defensive side of the ball, but offensively, I know you're probably going to go ham when the Taylor Heineke, I'm going to leave that space there for you, but also offensively, Antonio Gibson is something I've been saying because before the season started, we need to be concerned of the amount of times that he's getting these carries. You can already see, I think he was listening to the injury report. At least I was hearing that something flared up this week. I don't think it's good. He's in any danger of not starting next week, but I was surprised at Jared Patterson. I did not see him on the injury report uh, unless I'm mistaken, but he didn't get not any snaps that I saw offensively. They tried to get JD McKissick involved. I know he had the touchdown like four or five carries at most. Um, but it, it, I want to see more balanced attack coming from the running backs. I, mean, I want to see, we have three guys in there that I think could carry the football, maybe spread that load just a little bit and see if they can light a fire and get that offensive line kind of going with any sort of steam. I, I think Gibson got the ball so much that I actually recognize his name. So like that should tell you <laughs> that's too many because <laughs> I know two players. I know Chase Young because you can see his hair through the helmet. Everyone else is just a helmet. And then Taylor Heineke, he's got the ball. But I was like, oh, I actually recognize this guy. He's had the ball every fucking play. <laughs> yeah, now to Gibson's credit, 13 carries, 69 yards. Each time he touched the ball, he was very, very good. But I agree with KDOT. We would certainly like a more balanced attack. But time to get Mr. Matthew Regan involved over here in this show. What were your thoughts on the game? And let's go ahead and just, why don't we dive into Taylor Heineke's performance? What were your thoughts? I didn't watch the game, so... Next question. <laughs> See that Lions game. Pass though. on that. You gotta make it up. <laughs> Lions, yeah, I, I was I was busy that Thursday. I didn't I didn't put the Washington football team on my agenda. I know. I know. I work on a Washington sports pod, but for some reason, that was not on my to do list. But hey, happy for you guys. Uh, big win. You didn't want to fall in that own two trap. Um, and 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 you know, I, I think last week you guys could kind of discard some defensive stuff because week one. This week, I feel like you can discard some some defensive performance because it's just. Daniel Jones against Washington football team is just Tom Brady. So, you know what? Numbers don't count again. Move on to week three. I actually can't disagree with that point because Daniel Jones is Daniel Lamar Jackson Jones in there for some reason. Week 95 yards on the ground on nine carries. And it he's was fast. the same thing. He's one of the fastest you know, quarterbacks. He's very the fast. He is very, very fast and quickly plugging the preview show. K Dot and I did talk about contain Daniel Jones because he is an athlete. And like he's Matt got- said, He's, a little, he's got a little taste. Of the, he's faster than Eli Manning, but he still has that Mr. Bean on a football field. Just nothing can happen. We don't know why this is going on the way it's going on. He's just making shit happen. It doesn't make any sense. The white boy from Duke shouldn't be able to do this shit. <laughs> okay, he shouldn't. But let's talk about the other white boy from Old Dominion, Taylor Heineke, number four, but number one in our hearts, 34-46. 336 yards, two touchdowns, one devastating and interception well potentially devastating interception that almost ended the game but I thought overall he started off very slow let's begin with that he was nervous you could tell he had a couple very high throws I think the anticipation of the game got to him he turned into a sack I've never seen him do that before where he just stumbled over his own feet but he settled down as the game went on and as as he got more opportunities he settled into the game Elsie Let's begin with that sort of unbiased view. What were your thoughts on Taylor Heineke's performance this past Thursday? To me, I agree that he started slow. um, And and I think later he he settled in. But I actually had a question for all of you. As as somebody who doesn't watch enough football to know the answer to this, I wanted to know your thoughts on the interception, um, which is obviously a, a play that could have Well, I mean, it could have defined the game completely if it weren't for the kick slate or whatever. But I I want to know what you think about that interception. Because to me, like, I didn't know how to judge it on, like, is that a bad throw? Is that a miscommunication between, uh, you know, the receiver and the passer? Is that just a wonderful defense, you know, move? Like, the the guy just anticipated the play. Um, Because I wasn't sure whether to, like, not some points down for that interception. Or is that just, like, you know what, the defender did something exceptional. Like, sometimes you just can't, can't argue with that. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I would also be curious to hear KDOT's opinion on this as well. I, It was sort of just a bizarre play because McLaurin runs right into the linebacker, right? It is a timing route. So Heineke's letting it go no matter what. His job is to just let go of that ball. And Bradbury, James Bradbury, the guy who had the interception, has actually been teammates with Taylor Heineke. He's familiar with Scott Turner's system back in Carolina, as well as Ron Rivera. So I think there was a bit of history there too where he knew, hey, 
I get the feeling they may call a play like this because you could tell he was a speeding bullet running after that ball. He knew exactly what was coming. He, he, he was he going for it before it left his arm, which is the, like it didn't look like a reaction. It looked like he was he knew it was coming there. Yeah, that's exactly. why. I'm, uh, that's why, as an as an uninformed viewer, <laughs> I want to yeah. know: is that uh, normal? <laughs> so, actually, uh, let's throw it over to K. Dot because for me, I think there's a bit of blame on both. So, like McLaurin being blocked off, certainly because Heineke's supposed to let it go, but maybe it's on Heineke to make a split second decision to go. You know what? Let me take a sack here so that it forces the clock to keep going. K. Dot, what were your thoughts on that interception? It's a combination sort of thing. As you said, the, uh, McLaurin got basically chipped as he was going across to try to make that in route. And you can see he lets off like this, and it's supposed to be something he cuts inside. If he makes it inside, there's not the He's in front of the ball. There's a plan so he can box out Bradbury and make the catch. But Heineke, once he sees that happening, once again, it's lightning fast. But he's got to see that McLaurin's not on the spot. And that in that sort of situation with that much traffic, you take the sack. It was second down, no reason to force that ball in there like that because you can live for another day, especially when you got the lead that late in the game. So it's one of those things where we talk about Heineke having this gunslinger sort of mentality. And I've told, I think on the preview show, the Brett Favre stories and things like that. There is an element that he sees something, he's going to go do it, which you want instinctually in a football player. But that does lead to certain situations where he's got to know more situationally football-wise, hey, I can't force this thing if I don't see it clearly, not in that sort of situation. But there's also a matter of just the dial up of the play itself that was called by Scott Turner in that situation. I don't necessarily understand this airing it out in second and seven that late in the game when you have a Antonio Gibson, like you were saying, who had 69 yards on whatever, how many carries he was averaging like five point something yards a carry. That's not to me. It's, all right, we can run that down. If anything, we can throw it on third down. I think there's a balance between people trying to be too aggressive compared to being too conservative when they have the lead. All right, so before we move on to Wizards talk, let's talk about the rest of the season outlook. So Heineke stakes his claim for the starting position. We'll, we'll see. I mean, you know, if he continues playing at a high level and the wins keep racking up, I'm sure even if Fitzpatrick comes back, he'll keep the job. But KDOT, how are you feeling from the Washington football team perspective about the rest of the season, knowing that we have a pretty tough schedule here? Yeah, that's why this game was so important. Like, it, it's hard to want to say that something's a must win, but looking at our schedule, knowing that we don't have another NFC East opponent for a while, we need that win. Um, it's not going to get any easier. And I think right now there's still a lot of things that need to be shored up, especially when what I'm seeing on the defensive side of the ball, which is kind of concerning to me. But we also have Taylor Heineke, which is, if I'm not mistaken, this is going to be a first road game coming up. Um, we haven't even seen him necessarily on the road because, I mean, in the playoffs last year, he was playing at home. I think his start in Carolina, he was playing at home last two games. So I, there's still the jury's out on Taylor. We don't know what the preparation looks like for him and what he's going to look like when he is facing a road, when he is facing a road team, which is a damn good road team. So we're, we're not sure. Um, it, so there's just a lot. I still have no idea exactly what this team is. Because the positions in which we thought that they would excel the most, they are not doing what it is we need them to do. And if they don't do that, this could be a long season. Yeah, uh, that's, I think, the ultimate point. If the defense doesn't pull it together, if we can't cover anybody, like I remember reading about all the different, uh, you know, touchdown passes Heineke was throwing, Fitzpatrick was throwing, even Kyle Allen was throwing. Turns out we can't, car you know, guard for shit out there. Like if the defense doesn't get to the quarterback immediately, it's open season for the opposing quarterback. So again, we don't need, like Matt was saying, Daniel Jones to look like Tom Brady every single time he plays against the Washington football team. Up next, Josh Allen, who is an MVP candidate. So it's going to be a really, really hard game. How about basketball, guys? Basketball season in the NBA, right around the corner. The Wizards made a number of huge moves, including moving Russell Westbrook and getting some pieces in return in Contavious Caldwell-Pope, in Montrez Harrell, and Kyle Kuzma, bring in Spencer Dinwiddie. So there are a lot of new names. And then Corey Kispert, the first-round pick. Matt, I'm going to begin with you. The question is, which player are you most excited to see this preseason and then into the season. I will also have you know there is a guy named Bradley Beal. He goes by Brad, uh, and he's a really, really good basketball player for the team. Nice guard. Thank you. Thank you for that. Out of the um, I don't know. Does anyone really excite you about this? I guess Corey Kispert, he's a rookie. 
You could say KCP. I know about him from his Pistons days. He was drafted. Not that exciting. Kyle Kuzma, I don't know, seemed to hit a plateau in his career. So um, I guess I'm going to say by default, um, Corey Kispert had an okay, had a really good career at Gonzaga. Um, I don't think he's a super high ceiling player, but can be solid. So I guess it's just by default a rookie excitement. Um, but I'm not excited about this Wizards team. I mean, I, I don't know why. It was it was last year. We had a year with Russ. Kind of wanted to keep that going. Um, and this team is just less exciting. They might be better. They might be better. I, I, I don't disagree with the moves, but I think going into the season, I'm less excited about the team. Okay. And I want to hit on that point a little bit later. But first, LC, how about you? Who are you most excited to see this coming preseason and season? You know, for me, in the preseason, like, yeah, sure, let's watch the rookies and see whoever is trying to get a, a contract. Um, but in this season, I'm actually super excited to see Rui take on a bigger role. Um, you know, he's always been, whenever he's, you know, after being drafted, he's always been either number three behind uh, John Wall and Bradley Beal or number three behind uh, Russell Westbrook and Bradley Beal, however you want to order them. And I, I'm really excited for him to fight for the number two spot, right? Like he, he, you could put him at a, at a higher level than Kyle Kuzma and KSP. You could, some people, I guess, could argue for that. And so I think I'm really excited for him to be like, I'm option number two. I'm, you know, I'm also a leader in this team, even though I'm, I'm still young, but you know, he's now that we made so many moves. I mean, he's probably with Bradley Beal, one of the more, more veterans team that have been in the wizards, right? Like that, the one of those players who have been in the organization for a while. So I'm really excited to see his growth, to see what he does with his opportunity um super excited to see what uh, what he can do yeah no i'm also very very excited i think rui hachimura is a fantastic call over there because yeah i think last season was his season and this one especially especially is his season k dot the floor is yours who are you most excited to see on the wizards all right, preseason, fuck that. It's football season. I ain't watching no goddamn preseason basketball games. I'm sorry. I'm just going to keep it honest. So I'm going to go regular season. I'm going to say, actually, you're right on mark with Rui, LC. But I, I, I think I'm going to go with something a little more boring, which is Brad Beal. And I think that the, the reason I say Brad Beal is that he is, as Spencer would say, first banana. And there is no second competition for him. Like, even those years where Wall was hurt, this is John Wall's team. As much as we might behind the scenes think it's a Brad Beal thing, John Wall was top banana. You, Russell Westbrook, is on your team, unless LeBron's playing with him. He's top dog. I want to see the way the team comes around Brad and how Brad is being the leader in the locker room, the top guy. And I think that leaves a lot of opportunity, especially when a lot of these dudes that are now here are so-called friends of Brad Beal. Uh, Pope is supposed to be a friend of Beal. Uh, Dinwiddie is supposed to be a friend of Beal. These are all guys that wanted to play with him. So you're the top dog now. How are these guys rally around you and how do you carry the leadership as far as this team goes? I think we've all sensed it kind of behind the scenes as him being pretty much the leader because John Wall is too busy playing spades and shooting dice and doing whatever the fuck it is he's doing off the court. But I think Brad Bill being the top dog allows an opportunity for me to see who's going to be number two who's going to be the consigliere on the team. And I think Rui, to me, would be the most exciting thing. If he steps up, we've seen flashes. We've seen a lot of these flashes that have popped up over the last year. But when you've got a Russell Westbrook, when you've got a Brad Beal, there's not a whole lot that ball can be distributed. I think right now Rui could be the second banana for a very exciting Wizards team that I actually think are better than where they were last year. And I think them learning from Russ in that one year and learning the hunger and how you're supposed to conduct yourself in training only helps Brad and his leadership mentality because we know he's a hard worker too. I think this is something that is exciting about the Wizards team. I just want to see what Brad Beal does being top dog. Okay, so we got Rui, we got Beal, we got Kispert. Um, I've got a couple names. One, I'm surprised no one said Denny Avdia. I know that, you know, he hurt himself last season and there were some expectations to see if he could grow in a role. Uh, but I'm not going to say Denny Avdia, though I am excited to see him. When we realize we're not a top four team in the East, we're not potentially not even top six, we might be in the play-in all over again. We'll see. But when we talk about a culture change and when we talk about a guy fitting into the DC culture, I think Montrez Harrell gets me more excited than anybody else because this guy, he played in the Big East with Louisville, so he's familiar with Georgetown. He's familiar with just playing tough basketball. When 
he called Luka Doncic a bitch ass white boy. I was cool with it. I love that. I think his teammates are going to love it. And he just, not only does he talk though, he backs it up. When you look at his per 36 stats, he's top 40 in points. He's top 40 defensive, offensive rebounding. The man puts in the work and he is loud about it. I think he's going to rub off really well on Daniel Gafford. I think it takes some of the pressure off of Thomas Bryant coming off of injury himself. So I'm excited to see Harrell sort of be the guy, the energy guy while Brad just continues to eat from wherever on the court, he scores in every dimension and every facet of the game. But I think he takes the pressure and becomes the lightning rod of the team. And I'm like, I'm very excited to see the culture change with him. So I am very, very excited for Montrez I like Harrell. I think, I think he's going to be great. This city is going to love him, but I uh, want to talk. Go ahead. Go ahead. Elsie. I know. I, I say, I like that. And also like with the things point about Brad, like, I totally agree because I remember when when Brad sort of like the leadership role fell on his lap, right? Like John Wall got injured and we were sort of like surprised that he became a leader, right? Like it was sort of like, oh, look, this guy can lead. It was like, ah, we didn't know because we had John Wall the whole time. And so like, I, I think that's a, that's a great take on, on terms of like, now you, we know you can do it, right? We've seen you do it. Now this is your team and, and you got the stage and you there's nobody else like i mean nobody else to be the number one i yeah i, I think you you both made me excited uh and and matt we are excited so i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> well well so but i actually do want to hit on matt's point right which is that it does for some people seem less exciting and we want people at the games and things like that and if you're not as excited you're not going to go so matt why don't you go ahead and elaborate on that what makes it less exciting for you well, I mean, naturally, and, and, and for the flaws in his game that we've talked about on this pod, Russell Westbrook is still one of the most exciting players to play. And this is an entertainment industry. Uh, NFL's gypped. Like, the year yeah. we had Russ, Russ was the hometown guy. It was COVID. We couldn't go any games. It was like, what, what is this? Um, so, you know, yeah, like, I think Rui Achimar is a is a good player. And I think all these moves, I support the moves from a franchise standpoint, but as a who do I want to go see watch every night? Like Russ is a more exciting player to watch than Bradley Beal. Like Bradley Beal's better, but like, you know, he's probably just kind of picking apart, you know, hidden, hidden good shots, you know, um, yeah, layups and so, right. So like, vibe. Yeah. Like it, it's more exciting, you know, to see Russ. Um, like you can talk about culture, you can talk about, you know, big game stuff, but like stars are who you want to go see. And Russ is, you know, one of the biggest stars of fifth generation never got to go see him in person. Yeah, so the reduction of star power. I think that makes sense. It's a very simple but very clear argument there. I do think, though, that if this young team can get on a bit of a roll, even if they start off a bit slow out of the gates and then they win like, you know, five, six in a row or something like that, this, this town loves its basketball. And I do think that with Bradley Beal as the first banana and, you know, guys with high energy, Rui is one of those guys. Again, Montrez Harrell, I think, is going to bring it. And who knows? I mean, Kyle Kuzma, he's got, well, he's got the measurable. Go ahead, Elsie. Yeah. Well, I think we also need to say that, like, ch- just like we're expecting Rui to take a bigger role, Kyle Kuzma and KCP are coming from playing with LeBron and AD, right? Like, they're, they're coming from playing with full attention on someone else, right? And, and, like, they were able to play whatever they wanted to do, and nobody's going to question, nobody's going to say Kyle Kuzma lost that game when LeBron's in the court, right? It's just not going to happen. And so I would say that there's also an opportunity for them, right, to to become not not a top banana, but, you know, there's there's room for growth for any, for all of the young players in this team because it's not a star-studded team. It's, sorry, it's a team where you can make a, make, you know, your, your own footprint. And I think that, some of those players may surprise us and they may be like, you know what, now that I don't have LeBron and AD on my team and I have Bradley and I have Rui that are, you know, someone I can play more, more, more pair, uh, eye to eye with, then it's a different dynamic and that maybe they are absolutely able to take leadership. They just couldn't do it next to Yeah. And, and I am going to say the, the one thing that could change uh, Spencer Dinwiddie, he has had a very difficult time staying healthy. But if he can play 50 games, it's not something he's proven he can do. So we'll see. But if he can play 50 games and get that confidence and go, hey, I feel invincible. It's the best thing an athlete can feel is invincible, right? Then who knows? He could actually share the load properly with Brad and in some games be the guy. Spencer Dinwiddie is incredibly talented. 
And I mean, you see that Kobe Bryant acknowledged him as an all-star. He's just not the name that people think of. So he could end up just being a really, really good player. And we could have a very fun, efficient backcourt. So I'm excited to see how we do. But now it's time to talk about first pitches and coin tosses. Specifically celebrities. I want to know, we're going to go around, and I want to know which celebrity, this is a very interesting question, props to Elsie for this one. Should, should we say why? <laughs> should we say, and you have to say why you want that celebrity to but put out the first say why, coin why the prompt. So the prompt comes from Kamala, the vice president of the United States, doing the coin toss um, in the Howard Hampton, Howard versus Hampton football game. This, I don't know, it was this past week. I don't remember which day. Mm-hmm. It was not the best of luck for uh, Howard, but uh, I don't know if that team can do much. So. <laughs> no, <thank laughs> that, so, that's what encouraged the prompt. So, Elsie, uh, why don't you go ahead and lead us off then? What celebrity would you choose? And would it be a first yeah. pitch, coin toss, and why? So, okay, so I was trying to think of a coin toss, and I couldn't really come up with that with one, but I think it, I would love if it's a coin toss and everyone's mic'd up and then you would put somebody really funny. I, I think I can give you that if anybody has a great idea for that. But I was thinking of the pitch. Um, I have two, two sort of different ones. One would be like, I would love um, maybe, maybe a young version um, uh, of Jim Carrey doing some like really funny physical comedy pitch. Like, you know, he could just do some like, you know, that man was just an artist with his body and, and his physical comedy, just like Ace Ventura throwing a pitch. I, I would just, I would love to see that. Um, and on a similar note, maybe like an Olympic athlete, like Simone Biles just doing some freaking pirouette and then just at the end, just throws the ball. Yeah. Like, you know, those people who do like a flip throw, <laughs> throwing. So something like, something massive like that would be, would be pretty entertaining. Okay. I, I love those shots. <laughs> K-Dot, how about you? Yeah, uh, so... One is fantastical in the sense of, I'm going to do, can I do both? I'm going to do a coin flip, but I'm going to spend a little time on that. And I'll, I want to spend time on the first pitch. Hell yeah. So coin flip, it's when Washington football team, when the Washington football team finally decides the name, I would love to be able to resurrect Chuck Brown, go, go legend to flip a coin to be able to kick us off. Cause I don't think there'd be anything more DC representative than that shit happening. That'd be the shit. Still greatest concert I've ever been to in my life. Concert hall, Chuck Brown and the roots was amazing. All right, um, but going for first pitch, this guy can still do it. And I think we all got uh, bamboozled a few years ago when we missed the opportunity to boo former President Asian Orange bitch boy Trump throwing out the first pitch in that part. We want to boo your orange ass, son. And you didn't give us the opportunity because you backed the fuck out. You punk ass bitch. Like, (laughs) that's what I want. I want the opportunity. We go boo that motherfucker. Like that's what I want. Can he should have threw out the pitch. I, I need Philadelphia energy. I need batteries getting thrown. That's what the fuck I need. I need that. I need the team to turn their back on the asshole throwing the first pitch. I want the I want the catcher to be able to say, "Hey, that ball is going to hit the dirt." And just turn his back to this asshole. That's what I would have loved to see. And okay. I expect to get it back because history robbed me of that. Because you're a little bitch, Asian Orange. You little bitch. <laughs> You know, th- he things knew have. It. Dude, th- that's why he didn't do it. He knew. It. <laughs> things have been invented for dumber reasons. Now, so there could be a time machine in the near future. Uh, K dot. I guess I'll let you pick the place as well. It sounds like you would pick Philadelphia to be the place where that first pitch occurs as well. That's part can get it done. I think okay. if you give us the opportunity, we can get the boo birds going. We can do it. I think we can get a little bit of that filler. There's enough transplants around. I'm sure some people make the trip from Philadelphia to boo us anyway. Just keep the boos going. Like, hey, Phillies fans, if, you, if you're professional booers, come up. We understand you'll boo the game, but we just want you here to boo the president first. It's a short trip. We'll bust some of you guys in. It's what it is. Nats Phillies opening day. Boo former president Donald Trump. That's what I'd like to see. I love the idea of just let's play the Phillies. So that way we get some of them there as well. Matt, floor is yours. Who would you pick? I mean, I like the idea. I mean, I wasn't really sure. I didn't have a great answer for this, but I like the idea of like bringing in someone just to get booed, just an anti. It's not the honor. It's the dishonor. Uh, I have a question. I mean, it's kind of could lead to a second no hate debate. Like who right now is the most hated athlete in Washington? Oh, I was thinking I immediately jumped to Bryce Harper. Not anymore. I think after we won won, this one, it was like, it's over. Yeah. I don't know. He's, That's he's a good question. Here. I don't know about that. Um, I have an answer. But some sort of former athlete. Does anyone come to mind? I also really Would like he, to see, do old-time athletes still have it? You know? 
Like, I always <laughs> like the idea of like, you know, can Randy Johnson still pipe like 95 up in there? Hell yeah. Uh, <laughs> or like, <laughs> or would you want to see like the disastrous fall? Like someone should be good. Like wasn't, didn't Colin Kaepernick have like a bad throw or something, even though he was like a really good baseball player too. Like Anthony Fauci. Yeah. No, Fauci had a terrible so first pitch. Oh, oh yeah. man. Like, but you that know, he, you knew his that, that brought down the image so much. It, it brought down his image, but it gave faith and science to everybody, That's true. right? We're, we, we're like, okay, so we this know is what he, he spends zero minutes on sports. This yeah, man does not get a straight up nerd. He, <laughs> we can trust He's making sure He's like a seventy-five year old nerd, dude. <laughs> okay, oh, um, but I would say just for the pure, uh, and I'm I'm not a native DC guy, but like, would Joe Theismann get the biggest? Hype up. Wait, no, Joe's around too much. Joe's around. You can't. It's, not, it's not really coming back. Joe, do this podcast tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Just <lazy stuff. laughs> All right. Well, who would get the biggest? I'm not a DC guy. Who would get like the biggest uh, applause from the crowd? Oh, Vatican, Mike. Oh, Vatican. Yeah. I mean, everyone's obsessed with Ovechkin. I mean, the way he celebrated. Again, you know, after winning the Stanley Cup, that's pretty wild. How could you not? I think Ovechkin would be the guy that gets the biggest ovation. I think if they reunited some of like the 05 Washington formerly war football team players, like if you got Chris Cooley, Clinton Portis, if he doesn't go to prison soon, really hoping you don't, buddy. Uh, Santana Moss and those guys just came back and did so. I think that'd be kind of like a Sean Taylor tribute sort of thing. Like that, that to me would be like. Well, amazing. actually, actually, considering it's a first pitch, so implied baseball game, how about Howie Kendrick? Considering how well he did in game seven and also game five against the Dodgers, yeah, where he hits game the grand slam. Dodgers, yeah. So I think yeah. because people would be very familiar with Howie Kendrick at a baseball game, that could be yeah. interesting. Right. That's true. The that audience is. Yeah. Yeah. It, just right. playing to the audience. Uh, but well, there's only. Yeah, there's only one clear answer here. Um, and, you know, I was thinking about it, and it was tough at first. And I was like, well, this is a really, really hard question. I, Donald Trump, uh, you know, former president, did cross my mind. And I was like, he'd get booed. It would be fun for people. But there's a man who would get cheered so hard right now. And I think the people need Taylor Heineke to be throwing the first <laughs> pitch or doing a coin toss because he is still the second coming as of right now. Want to know, primetime game. That two yard, or sorry, two play seventy five yard drive, six to midnight, to quote one K dot from last week. I mean, the guy's walking on water right now. Who wouldn't want to see Taylor Heineke, arguably, arguably the best quarterback in the NFL right now? Go I ahead with that. Amit, Amit is getting a very uh, Amit to Taylor Heineke is LC to Diego Armando Maradona. We're getting close. Yeah, we're, getting there. We're, <laughs> we're getting there. We're getting there. One regular season win. Fully justified. Fully justified. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So that, that's the only way you have a shirt with his face on. <laughs> <laughs> Just might get there right after the Who's Brad shirt. Uh, <laughs> I have a Taylor Heineke jersey in my shopping cart right now. <laughs> there you go. See, this is how much football means to this city. I mean, this is what we're talking about here. So I, I my pick. Uh, would be Taylor Heineke. If I were to pick just another celebrity, um, let's see. I'm doing this on the fly. Dua Lipa. I don't care. You know, very attractive. Let's see if she can pitch to him. No, I I'd like no to idea. see. I like to see Shaq because I want to see how big, the ball, <laughs> oh, the, how small the, the, the ball looks like. Like, is it like a beer, like a ping pong? Like, does he throw it like like beer pong? Because it's just it's so little. <laughs> I think that's a good point. I, I think Shaq is a good shout as well. Any final any final celebrities you want to throw out before we move on to the State of the Union? Not Dale Earnhardt Jr. Okay, from yeah. inside his NASCAR. <laughs> he gets to drive it out and just he used to drive it on the mound, <laughs> throw it, do a few donuts, leave the field just a, a sobbing fucking mess, and just drives off. <laughs> just <laughs> I know he's a Washington football team fan. I don't know if he's a NASCAR. I know he's a diehard uh, football I'll team. I'll tell you what, you know who I would actually really love? Kenny Powers. Fictitious character, but Kenny Powers throwing out the first pitch. I don't know if you guys have seen he's bounded down, but if you have there is a scene where he's in Mexico and he drives out in a motorcycle and he's like, can I get an El Balo? It's one of the most racist things ever. And he gets a ball and he chucks it and he goes, if you were in America, there'd be a radar gun and it would read 101. It's iconic and it's excellent. And I would just burst out laughing if I saw Kenny Powers 
throw out the first pitch, aka Danny. If you're McCray. going fictional stars, I'm just waiting. Maybe watching it on the list. We know Ted Lasso is going to do it soon enough. Absolutely. Can we just Absolutely. Be, can we be the guys again. All right. <laughs> Well, I'll reach out to at least season three. Right. I'll, I'll reach out to Jason Sudeikis <laughs> on that one. But that's going to conclude the no hate debate this week. And now we're wrapping up with a very quick state to the union, your DC sports wraparound coverage segment. Let's begin with the bad news. The Washington Mystics. They had to win one of their last two games. They didn't. And one of those games was against the New York Liberty, who had lost seven games in a row. We lost to them. When we needed a win most, Shockingly, our fully vaccinated coach, Mike Tebow, got COVID, so he wasn't on the sidelines. Lose the two games. The season is over. We had a championship ceiling and a playoff floor, and we decided to take a hammer and just hit the floor. Fell right out. Lord knows where we are now, but the season's over. Off season, enjoy it. Enjoy it. The Washington Spirit do not deserve an update, so just a rough week for women's sports until they get fucking vaccinated. It's as simple as that. You want an update, get vaccinated. So that's the spirit. DC United, one and one last week. We beat Chicago 3 nothing, and then lost to Atlanta United 3-2. to two. That was a tough loss over there. But we're now in eighth place, just a point off a playoff spot and exceeding expectations. Exceeding expectations for this season. It was a lot of rebuilding. But Hernan Lozada, head coach, has done an amazing job. So we'll see how we continue. Up next, at home, against FC Cincinnati this Saturday at 7.30 p.m. The game can be seen on DCUnited.com and NBC Sports Washington. Maryland football, 3-0 on the season and 1-0 in Big Ten play. A 20-7 road win against Illinois, the fighting Illini. Up next, Saturday at 3.30 p.m. against Kent State. And that game can be seen on the Big Ten Network. And finally... KDOT and I are going to have a full preview show where we deep dive into this. The Washington football team play the Buffalo Bills in Buffalo, Orchard Park, one and one Buffalo Bills this Sunday, 1 p.m. You can see the game on Fox. And that concludes the State of the Union, your DC Sports Wraparound coverage segment. And this is District Divided. I am Amit. That is LC. That is KDOT. That is Matt. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you for putting up with some of the technical difficulties in the middle there. Really appreciate it. And we will see you guys next week, Wednesday, 3 p.m. Take it easy, guys. Stop running, President Agent Orange, you bitch boy. <laughs>